I want my KB Lake, KB Lake, KB Lake. Intel's KB Lake chips. Barbecue sauce. <laughs> I don't think anybody will even get that. It was it's the jingle from a Chili's Baby Back Ribs commercial and <laughs> I'm out of ideas. I don't know what to tell you. So Intel, it's CES. It's the beginning of CES. It's the inauguration of CES. I'm not there. Don't really, don't, don't know that I want to be there. But Intel's released new chips. It's updates, refresh. It's really Skylake do-over edition. Intel 6th generation is what Skylake was. So you see Intel 6th generation, Core i3, i5, i7, whatever. This is like generation 6.1. Although in all of the Intel documentation, it says seventh generation. So the Skylake chips of yesteryear, uh, there, there may have been a video of me. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing the, the Intel release. You may remember the Intel Box Master System. So uh, it's a little bit less ceremonious this time. So what's the, uh, what's the release? You know, we go from Skylake with this, the Intel Master System, to KB Lake, what changed? It's like, well, there's some racing stripes on the side of the box, but also, I don't know if you can see it on camera, this guy's mustache is waxed. Yeah, the, the waxed mustache really makes a huge difference in terms of speed. <laughs> oh, they're gonna murder me. No, no, no one's paying me to make this. I'm just on here, you know, saying random things. In fact, somebody's like, get him off, get him off, cut it, cut the feet. So the big change with the KB Lake release is of course the Z270 chipset. Now the Z270 chipset is, what, is what's in all these motherboards. We've done a review on literally every single one of them. We've got ASRock, we've got Gigabyte Aorus, we've got uh, ASUS and MSI. All of these boards uh, will reach five gigahertz with the i7-7700K CPU that I have. The launch day CPUs, I'm not exactly 100% sure what all of the launch day CPUs are, uh, certainly there's going to be the i7-7700K and the i5-7600K. There's also going to be an i3-7350K, although I'm not sure if that's launching on launch day or a little bit after. This is the first i3 part from Intel that is unlocked. And early reports suggest, you know, 4.8 gigahertz on the overclock, you can get that on a dual core part. I don't know, it's kind of weird though, because is it too little too late? Because a lot of games will take advantage of more than two cores now. It is two cores, four threads, so it's got hyper-threading. But you know, would you be better off with the i5 four core or the i7 in terms of you know cost to performance ratio? What's the price point going to be? I'm hoping for around 150, 160 dollar price point um, for the i3 7350K. But I have a feeling that Intel is going to push it a little bit higher than that. And so if you've got an older CPU, it's like you know if you're on Skylake, does it make sense to upgrade? In a word, no, no, it really doesn't. Uh, unless you like got a really, really specialty workload. Like I know that um, some people have discovered that programs that are very poorly multi-threaded, like Adobe Premiere, which you would expect to be really well multi-threaded, would perform well on an eight core CPU, a six or eight core CPU versus a four core, but that's not true. You know, the four gigahertz Skylake CPU will run circles around, you know, six, eight cores CPUs. And that's just because the, the software is poorly optimized. And so we saw a lot of other YouTube channels and content creators go for Skylake-based editing rigs with really fast disks. And so I think some of those folks are gonna upgrade. It's like, oh yeah, you mean I can have five gigahertz overclock, you know, four core, five gigahertz for my video editing rig? Heck yeah, sign me up for that. So I think we'll see some of that. If you're on an older platform, if you're on like an i5, i7, 2500, 2600, 2700, 2700K, if you've got a 2700K with an overclock, you could maybe think about upgrading. You could also wait for the next generation. You could wait for X299. You could wait for Zen from AMD. It really remains to be seen. The USB situation is also complicated. We've got a separate video on USB because you'll see some other boards referred to as USB 3.0. Some other boards will refer to their USB from the Intel chipset as USB 3.1. Sometimes you'll see USB 3.1 Gen 1. Sometimes you'll see USB 3.1 Gen 2. It, that explanation is, is, you know, five or six minutes in and of itself. So that's in a separate video. That's the next video in the series. And then there's a full review, including UEFI, including Linux testing on every single one of these boards. Uh, I've got the, the one Strix Micro ATX motherboard, but otherwise these are all ATX and the peripherals uh, that you get with each motherboard is, is pretty varied this time. Some of the motherboards have SATA Express, some don't. All of them have multiple M.2 uh, slots, even the Micro ATX, which has an M.2 on the back of the motherboard. Um, Z270 
adds more PCI Express connectivity through the DMI. Most people don't realize this, but the block diagram for the CPU is that it's got 16 lanes of PCI Express connectivity directly into the CPU, and there's an additional four PCI Express lanes through the DMI. Now, strictly speaking, those are not exactly PCI Express lanes. It's sort of a kind of modified PCI Express lane, and that goes to the DMI interface. And the DMI interface is for all of the other peripherals in the system. That's the chipset, Z170, Z270, whatever. Z270 ups that from 20 lanes on the DMI to 24 lanes. That's PCI Express Gen 3 connectivity, so you can have more peripherals. But it does not increase the overall interconnect speed from the DMI to the CPU. So the DMI to the CPU is still limited to four PCI Express 3.0 lanes worth of bandwidth. Even though there's more peripheral connectivity there for different motherboard vendors to take advantage of, the actual interconnect speed to the CPU is not really any faster. So, you know, does it make sense to run three drive, you know, uh, RAID M.2. Not really when you can get M.2 drives that are pushing two, three gigabytes per second. The absolute top end limit on that DMI interface is a little over four gigabytes per second uh, in terms of read and write speed. And so when you're talking about a single M.2 drive being able to saturate 50, 75% of that bandwidth, then, you know, RAID 0, with those M.2s, does it make sense? Uh, maybe if you get slower M.2s, maybe if you're doing right, maybe if you're doing some kind of exotic workload, I'm not really sure. The MSI board also has an interesting PCI Express arrangement in that you've got an option of running by eight for your graphics card and then by four by four in two PCI Express lanes. So this, if you've got, you know, like a by four PCI Express capture card or multiple by four PCI Express capture cards, you can do that. And those three slots are wired directly into the CPU. Some other higher end motherboards from, from each of these other vendors have similar functionality. And then of course we've, we see pretty much universally across the board a PCI Express slot that is wired through the DMI that's PCI Express by four. So if you're gonna run a single PCI Express by four peripheral, you can totally do that. And the M.2 slots are, are of course PCI Express by four, or they can be. Sometimes there are M.2 slots that share their PCI Express connectivity with other peripherals. So you might have to toggle an option in the UEFI to say that this M.2 slot has four PCI Express lanes worth of bandwidth, disabling a, a, a PCI Express by one slot on the motherboard or disabling something else on the motherboard in order to get the full bandwidth on the M.2. Otherwise the M.2 would run a PCI Express by two. So in the official paperwork from Intel, it says, oh, there's a 12 to 19% performance improvement for you know integers. And that's not untrue, but it's not the whole story. The 12 to 19 percent performance improvement comes from the fact that the CPU will turbo from you know a sleep state like 800 megahertz to its full clock speed much quicker than in Skylake. Not much quicker, but significantly quicker. And the, because the clocks are higher, the the numbers from Intel are always saying, well, let's take a look at an i5 and an i5. Let's take a look at an i7 and an i7. Let's take a look at an i3 and an i3. And it doesn't take into account anything at all. Like if you had Skylake and you locked your CPU speed or you did an overclock or anything like that, your you know integer performance gains are not going to be 12 to 19 percent. Clock for clock, KB Lake and Skylake are really the same performance. The the changes to KB Lake is an improvement in the 14 nanometer FinFET process that Intel calls FinFET Plus and that lets you break the 4.5 gigahertz ceiling that we saw on Skylake. So 5 gigahertz is pretty much the norm um, for KB Lake overclocking. I've got data from Gigabyte, from MSI, and from ASUS uh, that for their internal testing, we're talking a thousand retail CPUs plus. 75, 80% of those retail CPUs, not engineering samples, and the CPUs that I have are all retail CPUs, not engineering samples. Thanks to shady vendors on eBay. Uh, because K the KB Lake launch this time was, was leakier than a screen door on a submarine. It's just... I don't know, thanks Intel or, or Boo Intel, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know. So there's not really a lot that's been under a non-disclosure agreement. The, the uh, I just, I don't know, the, the, launch, the launch this time around has just been messy. But in terms of like performance gains, it's really not there. If you're on Skylake and you're not one of those edge cases, I don't know that there's a reason for you to upgrade. If you're running like a Skylake i3, getting the unlocked part, maybe. Uh, the, 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 the KB Lake parts, will work on Z170, but you'll need to update your UEFI. So if you buy an old motherboard, an old Z170, and like the i3 KB Lake, which I think is something that a lot of people will do because the Z170 motherboards will be on sale, make sure that you can update the Z170 motherboard 
uh, either through USB without a CPU installed that the motherboard supports that. Otherwise, you may have to call the motherboard manufacturer up and arrange an RMA or arrange a BIOS chip so that you can upgrade that. Because if you put an unsupported KB Lake CPU and a motherboard that will support it with a software update, but you don't have the software update on the motherboard to start, you're in an impossible situation unless you can update the UEFI on the motherboard to support that somehow, either by installing a CPU, an older CPU, and updating it, or if the motherboard itself has a mechanism to update through USB without actually having a CPU installed. Some motherboards have that function, some don't, especially on Z170. More motherboards on Z270 have that function now than I've ever seen before, so that's good. But there's still one or two Z170 motherboards that don't support updating through USB, so keep that in mind. So you might be thinking, well, what about cooling? How, what's the cooling situation? Uh, okay, we can get to five gigahertz, but how is that gonna work in terms of CPU cooling? Well, you're gonna need a good closed loop all-in-one cooler. You're gonna need a really good cooler overall. You're gonna need a top shelf air cooler if you insist on air cooling, but I would strongly recommend some type of, of water pump for cooling. I mean, if you wanna go custom loop, that's fine, but you're gonna need a high quality closed loop water cooler. You know, a 200, 240 millimeter radiator, most cases support it. There's really no reason not to. Um, all of the problems have been worked out. Some closed loop coolers will even warranty uh, the, the cooler to the extent that if the cooler destroys stuff inside your machine, they'll help you replace the stuff inside the machine that the closed loop cooler destroyed. So really, if you're gonna overclock, if you're shooting for that five gigahertz thing, five gigahertz is no longer a unicorn. Uh, it's, it's more, you know, I don't know, it's a workhorse, draft horse. Five gigahertz is your, you know, standard issue draft horse, I guess now that's attainable, but you know, it does require some care and feeding. Get a good closed loop water cooler and you can thank me later. That's pretty much it for KB Lake. In terms of like changes on the silicon with KB Lake, there's really not a lot. KB Lake and Skylake, in terms of instructions per clock, are identical. If you have a KB Lake CPU running at four gigahertz and you have a Skylake CPU running at four gigahertz, they are going to perform identically. The KB Lake CPUs are clocked higher out of the box and they're more overclockable in general than Skylake. Those are where the gains are. In terms of Tweaks to the silicon, there are tweaks around the iGPU, which is maybe useful if you're gonna use you know, Linux for the iGPU pass-through, but most everybody's gonna run an add-in graphics card. You're not gonna do something exotic like uh, it, you know, GPU pass-through uh, with you know, Linux, like the video that I did last year with Skylake. I wanna do an updated video for KB Lake, but that's a story for another time. Um, so in terms of that, that's pretty much it. There is also a dedicated video hardware area of KB Lake and it's because KB Lake was originally launched last fall because there are laptops that have had KB Lake forever. Some people have already enjoyed this. That dedicated video processing area has codecs in it in hardware for 4K decoding. What does that mean? Well, it means that, that instead of using the general purpose computation area of the CPU to do your 4K decoding, it's actually done in silicon. And so that translates to dramatically less heat production, dramatically less energy usage. And that's actually what you need right now. It's in production. If you have Netflix and you want to do 4K streaming with Netflix, you need a KB Lake CPU because Netflix wants to use the hardware decoder. Because if you're running Skylake or something like that, it's going to generate a ton of heat, especially in like a laptop. That's undesirable behavior. Uh, Netflix and others would rather use the H.264, the older standard, uh, which uses a lot more bandwidth if you're going to use 4K. So Netflix is not going to do that because a lot of people don't have that much bandwidth when we're talking about the older style encoding. So if you want Netflix in 4K, you need a KB Lake CPU, or at least you have so far uh, in terms of like having that hardware decoder. But other than that, not really a lot of changes. Most of the changes, you've probably heard me say it before, are improvements in peripheral connectivity. It's not really around instructions per clock. It hasn't really been improvements in instructions per clock for the last several generations. Let's dive in and go through all these motherboards. You know, I tried to make a 10 minute video on each of these these motherboards and I'm a talker so it's more like 30 minutes per motherboard so enjoy and if you pick up one of these let us know what your experiences are good or bad let us know in the forums because these these threads are going to be 18 months long which is probably about the lifetime of these motherboards so if you're watching this in like December of 2017 then yeah you should still check out those threads because there's probably a lot of people that have bought these boards and have shared their experiences there on our forum so if you pick up one of these boards or you're thinking about it or you're doing the comparison shopping let us know what the criteria is let us know what you're looking for let us know uh, what your thoughts are on the products that you're taking a look at in the forums at level one techs i'm wendell i'm signing out and i'll see you there well actually i'll see you in the next dozen or so videos and then i'll see you there